So over three decades now, I am that old, I have been serving and building the local church. It has been the greatest joy and challenge of my life. I have seen in the church the good, the bad, and the ugly because church is full of people and people are not perfect. And I am still committed to the greatest days of the church. But I guess as I'm getting ready to turn 50 next year, I kind of felt like I was reflecting a little on what I've witnessed around the global church as things we've done well and things that maybe we've not done as well. Things we've given a lot of airtime to and maybe things we've given less time and mention to. And today I want to speak to something I believe we've given lesser time to that actually I think will scoop up more in the room today than maybe you're about to realize. I think in the church, one of the things we've done well is that we've spoken a lot about how God is the restorer of the broken. We've heard messages that have met us in our brokenness, ministered to our brokenness, talked to us about He binding up the brokenhearted and mending those who are broken in spirit. He has healed many of our broken bodies in seasons and put back together what felt it was beyond repair. We sing songs about the God that restores the things that are broken. We have lyrics that help us connect with the healing power of God. And I'm so thankful for the healing power of God that takes what is broken and makes it well again. But I think when we hear messages about brokenness in any room of any size, there are those that would say, that is me, and immediately identify. But at the same time, there are so many people that when we touch on this subject feel that was me, but now I don't necessarily identify as being a broken person anymore. And so when we hear that message, we kind of already have switched off because we're like, well, this is not for me. It used to be where I am. It's not where I am right now. And so I'm not leaning in in the same way. And thus in any room at any given time, half, if not three quarters of the church can have checked out feeling that, you know, I don't need this message. So today I'm not here to speak about the broken, though if you are broken, there is hope for you today and God can restore you today. I'm here to deal with the three quarters, maybe more of you in the room who think that that doesn't apply to you, but you're still not right. <laughs> Because today, I don't want to speak to you about being broken. I want to speak to you about being out of order. You ever walked up to a vending machine and it looks like it's functioning and the lights are on and it's buzzing and the drinks are on the inside of it and you go up because you really want what's inside the machine. But as you get closer, there's just this little sign that's stuck on the machine that lets you know it is out of of order. It's functioning to a degree, but if you put your money in this machine today, you may not get out of this machine what it was that you were expecting it to deliver. Something is off. Something is not quite right. And what I've realized in the church is that we come with our Sunday best and our Sunday smiles, but so many of us, if we got closer up to the life and close up to the machinery and the dynamics of your life, I would find the same sign on your marriage or on your your business or on your finances, though you are functioning in person, there is something that's not quite right. There's an out of order sign in an area of your life. And today I want every single person that feels out of order to realize you can get back in order, that there is an alignment for your life that will change actually the whole trajectory of your life for many of you are functioning, but you are not flourishing. Many of you are on but something is a little off. Many of you are surviving, but you certainly are not thriving. And God wants you to get your out of order back in order. Let me illustrate for you today in order for you to get this picture in your head. If this was your life, your ministry, your finances, your family, your commitments every day, you put your life on and you go about doing life in the area where you live and work and all that is attached to that. So we put our life on, on Monday, we put our life on on Tuesday, but this is how some of you put your life on. It's right, but it's wrong. It's on, but it's off. I've put my life on, but something is out of order. 
And this picture is describing for so many of you today what's going on in your marriage, in your parenting, in your career. It's on, but it's off, and you've not had language for it because you don't fully feel it's broken, but you also don't fully feel that it's flowing in the way it needs to flow. And let me tell you something, so many Christians live their entire life this way. And this is not the best that God has for your life. But in order to get back in alignment, in order to get back in order, we have to be brave enough to admit that there are things out of order. And we can't get it back in order until we take out of the top button what shouldn't have been placed there and start getting the right thing at the top. Because once the top is right, everything else will find its place. And so today, I don't have five top tips for you to live your life effectively. Sorry if that's the message you were hoping for, because I don't live your life. I don't have your responsibilities. I don't do the job that you do. And I've realized giving people points of how to do their life better only makes them more confused sometimes, because points are not going to help you, but principles will. And today I want to give you some principles that to me are top button principles for how I have done life for over 30 years in ministry. Top button principles for why I'm still with my husband 31 years later. Top button principles of why we're raising our kids and they love God and are actually quite good kids. They're normal, not weird. And these things I have tested in my own life and therefore I want to Um, express them and encourage you to test them in your life. Where is there a relational, emotional, spiritual, financial out of alignment that today God wants to help you put back? If success is your top button, then stress is a guarantee. If people pleasing is your top button, then exhaustion is in your future. We have put all the wrong things at the top, which is why so many of God's kids, their life looks more like grind than it does grace. We're not called to have a world that looks like the world around us. We're called to have an inner world and an outer world that reflects the God within us. And that's why in Matthew 11, verse 28, Scripture says this, Are you tired? Are you worn out? And there's a lot of tired, worn out people. Are you burnt out on religion? Come to me. Get away with me and you'll recover your life. I'll show you how to take a real rest Walk with me and work with me and watch how I do it. Learn the unforced rhythms of grace. I won't lay anything heavy or ill-fitting on you. Keep company with me and you'll learn to live freely and lightly. In other words, when you do life God's way, there is a grace even when it's difficult. There is a grace even when it's testing. There is a grace even when there are seasons where you feel like things are falling apart. God holds it together if we prioritize our world the way that He wants us to. So today, where is the out of order time to get back in order? It fascinates me when I read about Jesus's life because Jesus, he kind of had a big job. Hello. You know, like, like, like he had an assignment like savior of the world. Last time I checked, I don't know what your job is or your career is, but last time I checked, nobody else has that job title. There's no one in here that is the savior of the world. Sorry if that just burst someone's bubble right in that moment, but it's not you. It already has been accomplished. And so, and so I read Jesus's life, 33 years, that's all he had to accomplish this mission. I have read the Bible over and over again, and I've searched, and I cannot find one passage where it says, Jesus was so stressed out. He was having such a hard week. His schedule was totally overrun. He'd not managed to get to the meeting with the disciples. He had to cancel healing the leper. He had to move the appointment with the blind man to Friday because Thursday overran in meetings. Like, it's not there. It's not there. Jesus is chill. (laughs) Jesus is not stressed. Why? Because Jesus is not living his place from where we live our place. Jesus knew what his top button was, which is why in John 6 verse 38, he says, I came from heaven not to do my thing, but I came to do the will of him who sent me. I know what my priority is. I know why I'm here. And people, when you know why you're here and you know what your priority is, everything else 
comes into order. Today, I'm trying to hand you a gift that if you will receive it, you will get peace back and grace back and joy back. Yes, you will, because this thing works. And so let me give you some principles. You can tell I'm passionate. Well, yeah, let me give you some principles because I love when I realize truth can set people free. Let me give you some principles today that are top button principles that if you adopt them into your life, I'm telling you, you're going to find grace come back. Number one is this, mission must be more important than position. Mission must be more important than position. We live in a world where everybody is chasing a title or a badge or wants a position or finds their importance or worth in some status or in some company promotion. But we are not here to run our life like the world. We are called to something far greater than a temporary position. We're called to a life that serves an eternal mission. And so when we get those two things the wrong way around, we get ourselves into a place of striving. If position is priority for you, then mission becomes casualty for you. And I don't want any more for the mission, the greatest mission on planet earth, the greatest mission of serving God and building his kingdom and seeking him. I don't want that mission to be lost anymore because of our selfish world that tells us position is more important. Matthew 6 verse 33 says it better than I could. Seek first the kingdom. Hello, top button. Seek first the kingdom and all the other buttons will find their place. This is a principle that if you live your life by, you will find all that other stuff will find you. You don't have to go find it. All that other stuff will chase after you when the top button is correct. When I first came into ministry, when I first felt God calling me into ministry, God took me to a passage in scripture. I'd like to tell you that I was excited about the passage he took me to, but I was kind of disappointed. It was a passage in Exodus 17 that has been my mission for my entire life in ministry and continues to be. In Exodus 17, it paints a picture of an army that are being defeated by God's people. And they're being defeated because there are people that are told to stand in the place and take up the mission. I'm going to have my people come and show you practically what was going on. So the story goes that there is Joshua on the front line. Joshua is fighting and he's defeating the Amalekites and he's in the shiny suit and he's on the front line. So when God showed me this story, I'm like, I get it, God. I'm called to be a Joshua. Here I am, Lord, send me. I will be Joshua on the front line for you, Jesus. I think that sounds exciting. I think that sounds like, you know, it could be a cool thing to do. And I felt God say, be quiet. You're not Joshua. I was like, okay, God. I will be quiet. Okay, God, I get it. I'm not Joshua because there's another person in this story and that is Holy Mo, Moses. And so I must be Moses, Lord. It says that Moses was on the hillside while Joshua was on the front line. And actually Moses, his arms were uplifted. And while his arms and the staff were in the air, they were actually winning. But actually, if his arms began to be lowered, the entire battle was losing. So actually, it was nothing to do with Joshua why they were winning, it was all to do with the position of Moses' arms. So I said, oh God, I get it. I'm Moses. That's what you're asking me to do. Uphold the people, help the people, be the person on the hill. I can be that hero. And I felt God say, no, I didn't ask you to be Moses either. It's like, but God, there's only two people left in the story. And basically their job is to be a glorified armpit holder. And this is pre-deodorant. And this is a hot day and this is not a nice spot to be in. And I'm pretty sure there was a flapping robe going on right about here and you're downwind of some unpleasant aromas. And I'm like, Lord, you're not telling me that my call in life is to be Aaron and her. And I felt God say, not only am I telling you, I need you to go tell others. It's their job to be Aaron and her because Aaron and her had to be so mission minded that they didn't care about their position because they realized if we walk away from what it is that why our part is to play the whole Whole thing is over. And can I tell you, we live in a time where there's an entire generation who do not like this position, who do not want this position. So we go off looking for another position. And when we do, the entire mission is lost. He said, while his arms were lifted, then the victory was ensured. But when his arms were lowered, if they didn't hold them, the whole battle was over. And here's what the enemy wants to do. He wants to get all of us to get so position minded, we start drifting from the mission. 
We start chasing the career and chasing the job. And while we are, the mission of your family, the mission of your marriage, the mission of the kingdom is not anymore top button. It's this over here. And while you are chasing this over here, all of this here begins to be lost. That's why there's so many people that on their deathbed, their biggest regret is, man, I wish I'd never given all my time to that. I wish I'd never chased that. What they're saying, I put the top button in the wrong place. I've I lost sight of the mission of the call of my life. I've lost sight of the bigger picture. And so when I was 15 and God showed me this picture, I was like, I get it, God. I'm just going to find people who you need me to lift their arm for. And I'm going to gladly do it because I realized that's a better position than I could ever have, which is why David said, I'd rather be a doorkeeper in the house of the Lord, which is a lowly position, but I'd rather do it because I'm in an environment that is mission focused than being in the tents of the wicked, having the best day. He say, no, this is a priority for my life. Thank you guys. This is a priority for my life, which is why in Matthew 20 verse 20, when the disciples mom the pushy mom, I'm sure there's none in this room today. But the pushy mom's like says to Jesus, hey, Jesus, my boys, I want them to have the best position. I want them to have like the best seats in the house. The one on the left and the one on the right. Could you give that to my boys? And Jesus is like, you don't even know what you're asking for. You're asking for something that you don't even understand the price tag attached to. When did it become about position? When did it come about status? When did it come about what flatters most instead of what matters most? The enemy loves to stroke our flesh and feed the part of us that drifts us away from the thing that actually is what keeps us in order. Rather be a doorkeeper in the house of the Lord. I'd rather lay down my agenda and pick up his cause. That is what Christ modeled to every single one of us. For even the Son of Man, the Bible said, did not come to be served, but to serve. Second principle to build your life around is you've got to choose your motivation over expectations. <clears throat> so many of us are placing the expectations of others or the expectations that we have of a situation as the top button that we serve. In other words, I'm going to serve this because I expect this to do this for me. I'm going to, I'm going to love you because I expect you're going to love me back. I'm going to have you for Thanksgiving because I think next year you'll have me for Thanksgiving. I'm, I'm, I'm going to bless you because I think when I bless you, there's a chance I'm going to be blessed back. I'm going to give to that because I think when I give to that, I'll benefit back. We've made what God asks to be sacrificial, transactional. We've moved from being motivated in a way that is pure to having a drive that is based on an expectation that is not pure. But Jesus modeled a life that did not come based on expectation. Hello. He healed those who said nothing of thanks in return. I know we read about 10 lepers and one said thank you, but you do realize Jesus would have healed all 10 whether any said thank you or not. He wasn't healing based on expectation. He was healing based on his motivation, which was compassion and love for those that were hurting. How many of our lives are more of a reflection of expectation? I'm going to do this if you do that. I'm going to give if you do this. I'm going to serve if you applaud me. <laughs> Man, I would have quit ministry years ago if the only reason I was doing it was for applause. Man, I would have quit preaching years ago if all I was doing it for was an amen. Hello. Thank you. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? I had to work hard for that one amen. But that's what happens when you do what you do with an expectation of something being done for you. You quit in the silent times. You quit in the difficult times. You walk away when it's not convenient anymore. But Christ came and forgave you even though you didn't deserve it. And there was nothing coming back from you. And he, and he came and he sent his son and he died on a cross knowing that there would be those that said crucify him and betrayed him and walked away from him. He didn't do it based on expectation and if he did none of us would have our salvation 
So where did we drift so far from the ways of God? That's why when the Pharisees are trying to test Jesus, they're like, what's the top button? What's the top button? Jesus is like, I'll tell you what the top button is. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your passion, with all your intelligence and love one another as you love yourselves. Have a motivation that's locked in. Have a decision that means that you are not open for manipulation. You know how many people I see leave ministry because expectations have been manipulated? People pleasing has become the top button. Jesus didn't even please his friends. Think about it. If there was ever an expectation Jesus should have fulfilled, it was when his friend Lazarus is dying. Hello? Hey, Jesus. Lazarus is your mate. We feed you. We look after you. So you owe it to us to show up and heal your buddy. Seems a reasonable expectation. Seems like something that could come from a genuine place. What does Jesus do? He hears the expectation and stays where he is two more days, which is sufficient enough time for the illness to get worse and Lazarus to die. Jesus, what part of this do you not understand? Surely you know when so-and-so calls, you have to run. Surely you know when that person says, tone it down, you better tone it down. Surely you say, you know, that when that relative that's coming for Thanksgiving expects a certain thing, we have to do a certain thing. God says, no, I, you don't have to serve expectations. You just have to love. Just have a motivation of love. Just have a heart that is centered on the one who gave it all with no expectation for you to do anything back. He chose you before you ever chose him. When did we start living our life in the way that Luke 6 describes? Luke 6 verse 31 says this, if you only love the lovable, do you expect a pat on the back? <laughs> Run of the mill sinners do that. You only help those who help you. Do you expect a medal? Like when did we drift so far from our motivation being to love, from our motivation being to care? Why? Because he first loved and cared for us. So if you want to get your top button back in your marriage, let your motivation be love. If you want to get your top button back in your parenting, let your motivation be love. If you want to get your top button back in the area of your relationship with God, get your motivation back of love for him and let expectation come lower down the list than your motivation. Finally, another principle that I can't impress on you enough and I feel honored that I get to share this principle in this house today for this house to me speaks of this principle. And so therefore, if you are in this house, whether you've been here for a month or whether you've been here for 20 years, whichever way that this finds you today, let me tell you and commend you to follow the principle that is being modeled to you. And that is this, that legacy must always be more important than what's temporary. I stand here today on a church that understands this principle more than most churches that I have the opportunity to go and visit because we live in a world that is so temporary mindset. Now listen to me. I love Ikea. <laughs> but can I just say to you, stop filling your life with Ikea furniture. Here's what I know about Ikea. It is good for the moment but I ain't handing down my Ikea furniture to my children's children. It won't be here. It's not going to last that long. I'm going to Ikea to get something to get me by. I'm going to get the extra chairs for Thanksgiving guests. I'm going to get the furniture for the temporary season of the nursery baby. I'm going to get something that gets me through the first years of my marriage life. And then I'm going to invest in a piece that can be handed down to generation to generation. And that's going to cost me more. And it's going to take longer to find, but it's going to have a legacy beyond my own life. When did we put the top button as temporary? And now we 
come to church if it pleases me. Now we invest in what benefits me. Now we serve at the events I like, but not the events I don't like. Then we're here on the Sunday where I feel down because I need an uplift. But on Sundays when I'm good, I'm just going to stay home in bed because, hey, that's a temporary mindset. But when you understand legacy, you realize, man, I'm not choosing based on my feelings because feelings are liars. <laughs> I'm building on my principle, whether I feel like it or not. I am investing in the future, whether I feel like it or not. I am showing up because there's a generation that needs me to show up. You are in an auditorium. You are sat on chairs. And I guarantee some of the people that gave to build this sanctuary and gave to purchase those chairs are no longer this side of heaven. They are already in the great cloud of witnesses. But thank God that they didn't say, well, I'm not putting money in the offering unless I get to sit on that chair for the next 20 years of my life. Well, I'm not sowing a seed unless it's at a campus that I attend. Well, I'm not putting money into the legacy giving unless it's something that benefits me and my children. No, the heroes of faith that went before us. Thank God for the heroes of faith that went before us. It tells us in Hebrews 11, they live, live their lives from a very, very different place. It says that they actually, each one of them, they, they died and they didn't get to have in their hand what was promised. But they weren't disappointed. Why? Because they were still believing and they'd seen it off in the distance and they waved to it like, hey, I might have never get to be in that building. Hey, I might never get to put my kids in that facility. But hey, I see in the future how my giving today is going to build a legacy for tomorrow. And I'm rejoicing in it as if it's happening right now. Why? Because I don't want to leave behind Ikea. I want to leave behind legacy. We are called to be today's heroes of the faith. But we've made hero something that the Bible never made hero. We've made hero a shiny microphone. We've made hero a best-selling album. We've made hero somebody that has a mask and a cape and superpowers. But actually a real hero is someone that sees a life beyond their own life. A real hero is someone who says, I am born for such a time as this to use my voice, to use my hands, to use my heart, to leave something that is a legacy for the future. We get to be heroes today. Every single one of us. And I believe that God forensically, divinely orchestrated that I would be here today when maybe you would have rather had a message about turkeys and Thanksgiving. But after you've eaten your turkey and after you've said thanks, if you don't get the top buttons right, your marriage will go back to being out of order. Your parenting will go back to being stressful. Your job will go back to chasing things that will never reward you in the way they promised to. And so the greatest gift I could bring today is not to speak on something that is temporary, but to speak on something that has eternity within it. That this is a house, that Seacoast, you are our church, where God says, for such a time as this, the whole leadership of this house, are modeling what this looks like. They're saying, hey, we're not going to get out of order by chasing position. We're going to make sure the top button is mission. Hey, we're not going to build a house that's based on expectation. We're going to build a house that is motivated by love. And hey, we're not building a house that will be here today, gone tomorrow. We're building a legacy that will speak way beyond our days and time here. And we'll be able to celebrate from eternity. Church, this is our hour. This is our time. So whatever is out of order today, some of you, it's your marriage. You put your job before your marriage. Some of it's your parenting. You put everybody else's demands beyond the own call to be a mission-minded father or mother in that place where God has entrusted you to parent. Some of it's your money. You're trying to invest and do all these kind of things. And listen, God says the world of the generous gets larger and larger, not the world of the posture-minded person that's trying to make it happen all by themselves. Today, maybe what you're seeking is what's stressing you out. And if you would just seek first the kingdom, all these things would be added. 
all across the house today in every campus. I would love us to stand to our feet. Time is gone, but I want to pray. And after this prayer time, it's going to lead to a ministry time that you know you have every week an opportunity to receive prayer or to come forward to one of the places and just have a time and a moment with God. And I'm praying today that in that ministry moment that's about to follow, some of you as couples will come and say, we got to put this in order. Some of you would say, God, I need to lay down my priorities and I need to pick up your principles. Here's the thing I know. God can't fix what we don't admit is broken. He can't put back in order what we don't say is out of alignment. So today, the honesty is the beginning of the healing. And so I want to pray for every single one. In a moment, you're going to get to respond in your own way. But before that, just close your eyes where you are. God, I thank you today for this house and for every person in the room. God, I thank you that the assignment for their life is not to live stressed, is not to live in the grind, but to find the rhythm of grace. And God, I pray today for a boldness for everything that is out of alignment to surrender and submit it back to you, Jesus, to put it back in alignment. God, I pray our lives, our words, our choices, they would reflect our priorities, our principles. That God, we put you first. That we seek first your kingdom. That God, we don't chase what the world chases, but we say we'd rather be a doorkeeper We are mission-minded. We are legacy-minded. We are motivated by love for you and love for others. All across the house today, as eyes are closed, there's one more thing I want to ask. Maybe today, the reason why you are out of order is because the top button called surrender, called salvation, is not attached. That you're in church and you're around church, or you might even be visiting for Thanksgiving holiday. Someone brought you today, and today I'm here to let you know that you can get your life back in order, but God has to be number one, not you. And the way we do that is we just surrender. We say, God, I make you first. I put you first. Maybe you've drifted from God. Maybe you're backslidden today, and today there's an opportunity to put that right. So right now in this moment, if you would say, Charlotte, that's me today. I want to start off today, to this week with putting that button right. I want to come back to God. I want to give my life to God. If that's you, just stick your hand in the air whilst everyone else's heads are bowed and eyes are closed. You're just saying, that's me today because I want to pray for you today. Your honesty in this moment is the beginning of that right alignment, that first top button being put right. You can lower your hand and just place it on your heart for all those that just responded. Thank you. I'm going to ask everyone to repeat this prayer after me to help you seal this decision in your life. So church, after me, let's all say these words. Dear God, today I choose to put you first. I surrender and I call you Savior. Today I receive forgiveness and I choose freedom. Thank you, Jesus, that you first loved me and that you first gave your life for me. I choose to follow you all the days of my life. In your name, amen and amen. Let's thank those people.